So if I've got a string, let's say it's fixed on one side, uh, or both sides, when I send a pulse down, and let's say a transverse pulse, so the particles are moving at 90 degrees to the direction of the pulse, when it reaches the far end where it's clamped down, it reflects back on the opposite side. That's because this far little particle can't move up and down the way that its brethren did. So instead, because it's fixed in place, when the particles next to it start to move up and attempt to tug it up, it ain't going anywhere. That little bit of increased tension pulls the rest of them downward, and so it reflects back on the opposite side. So if I send an upward pulse and it hits the closed end, it comes back as a downward pulse. Now, the opposite's actually true once you have an open end, a totally loose end that's free to move up and down. If I send a pulse that time, then that free end just moves up and down and it just comes back on the exact same side. If I start to send a series of pulses, then one of them might interfere with the previous one, and you get some sort of interference, either constructive if they're both on the same side, or if they come on opposite sides of each other, you get destructive interference there in the middle. Now, when you continue to send a series of pulses over and over and over again, and they continue to interfere with each other, you can get what's called a standing wave. And all that a standing wave is, is a series of pulses that constructively and destructively interfere with each other, all on one string, for example, or one column of air. And it makes a wave that looks like it moves back and forth from crest to trough, but it has no ultimate forward velocity. Now, the pulses themselves are moving back and forth across a string or the pocket of air or whatever's vibrating, but the overall wave looks like it's just moving from crest to trough and crest to trough. So as an example of this, I got a simulation up here uh, where I'm going to grab a fixed end on one side, the other side will have an oscillator that'll be moving up and down, so I'll have one loose end and one fixed end. So at the fixed end, the pulses will come back on the opposite side of the string, so an upward pulse will come down uh, to the downward side on the way back, and on the loose end, the reflection should just go back the exact same way. As they start interfering with each other, you should start to see a uh, little bit of a standing wave there. It looks like there's not a single pulse that you can actually discern heading from the oscillator over to the clamp. Um, so if I pause it at the right time, then I should be able to pick out what are called nodes and antinodes a place where there is no movement of the particles, meaning there's always destructive interference there at all times. We're always getting a crest meeting a trough. That's where I get a node. And that includes any fixed end that might be there. The regions of the standing wave where I'm getting the most constructive interference, it's actually shifting back and forth from constructive to destructive to constructive the other way to destructive, to constructive the other way, those regions of the string are called antinodes. And once you've got all your nodes and antinodes labeled, it's actually really easy to tell um, how much of a wavelength is fitting on this length of a string. Between any antinode and the next antinode, there's always half a wavelength, for example, from crest down to trough. From one node to the next node, there's always half a wavelength. So if I wanted to go two adjacent antinodes over, that would be one full wavelength, and so on and so forth. Between every antinode and the following node, there's always one quarter of a wavelength in there. So for example, let's say that this entire string I knew, for whatever reason, was three meters in length. And I wanted to know a little bit about the standing wave that's fitting on there. Well, in this particular example, I start at one antinode, I travel down to another antinode that's half a wavelength, the next one that's another half, so I've traveled one full wavelength. Down to yet another antinode, there's another half, so we're at one and a half in total. And then I hop up to the next node. That's another quarter wavelength. So in total, I traveled one and a half plus a quarter, that's one and three quarter of a wavelength. So, for this particular standing wave, I could label the string two different ways. L equals 3 meters, and the same distance, that same 3 meters, equals 1.75 lambda, or 1.75 times the wavelength. So I could then go back and just write, well, 1.75 lambda equals 3. Set my two uh, different types of labeling equal to each other, 
and ultimately, you'd be able to solve for what the wavelength of the standing wave is. And that's what's going to be really important when we come to resonant frequencies. Now, depending on uh, whether the ends are fixed or not, you get different patterns of standing waves. So again, on every single fixed end, you get a node. On every single open end, you get an antinode. So, an example is a guitar. If I play a guitar, it's fixed down on both ends, and the standing waves that I can fit in there will go from one node to the next in the first harmonic, and that'll be it. That'll just be one half a wavelength fitting there. But if it's in the second harmonic, then it'll still go from node to node, but it'll put another node right smack dab in the middle there. Well, that fits exactly one wavelength, and so on and so forth. Basically, the different harmonics are a way to get from one node on one end to the node on the next, with a certain number of nodes in between. The first harmonic has no nodes in between, the second has one in between, and the third has two in between, and so on and so forth. So as the harmonics increase, my total wavelength, let's assume this is all the same length string guitar, the wavelength itself is decreasing, getting smaller and smaller, and the frequency to drive it is increasing. In fact, because the wavelength decreases by a factor of two uh, from the first and the second, that means the frequency increases by a factor of two. Same deal if it's open at both ends. Let's say like a flute. A flute has two open ends that you blow air through. You get antinodes on that side. So if I go from one antinode to another, I get half a wavelength. If I do it for the second harmonic, then I go from crest to trough to crest. That's one full wavelength. So it's the same sort of pattern for the number of wavelengths that are fitting in there. The special case is when you've got one closed end and one open end. For the very first harmonic, the fundamental, I go from a closed end. Oh, by the way, this would be like a trumpet. On one side of your trumpet, your lips are closing it off. On the other side, it's just an open bell. So I'd get a node on the closed side. I'd get an antinode on the open side. And I'd only fit one quarter of a wavelength from a node to an antinode in here. The next harmonic up, I would fit, well, there's half a wavelength and another quarter. So that'll be three-quarter lambda in there. Now I've not decreased my wavelength by a factor of two. This time I've done it by a factor of three. So for this reason, if you've got one closed end and one opened end, you don't get any even-numbered harmonics. Because again, the definition of the second harmonic is a standing wave in which the frequency is two times the fundamental of the first. I don't get that with one open and one closed. The next harmonic up is the third harmonic, because I've multiplied my frequency times three. Now to help me demonstrate a real-life standing wave, I'm going to need some help from my physics assistant, Starship the Cat. So, Starship will pin down her end of the string, creating a closed end, meaning there's a node right where she's holding it. Meanwhile, I'm vibrating the string at its resonant frequency. Um, you can see a little node right in the middle, a spot where it's not moving. Meanwhile, on my end of the string, it's difficult to see, but I'm just holding a wand with it. So that's an open end of the string. It's not being clamped down at all. The wand is just shaking back and forth. So you get an antinode there. When I increase the frequency of the vibration of the string, at first you get a jumbled mess because a standing wave isn't perfectly fitting on the string, until finally you end up with an upper harmonic standing wave. So it's another resonant frequency, just a higher one. Ah, well done, Starship. Good girl.